Hi, Misha here, and I have something a little different, at least compared to the other models I've reviewed so far and talked about the history of. And uh, I do apologize, this is going to be one that's very difficult for me to record because it is very big. On the other hand, at least probably some part of the plane will be in the shot at all given times. Right? As most of you, hopefully, by hopefully seeing it, have already guessed, this is the Boeing B-17. Flying Fortress. And this is the G variant. So pretty much the uh, definitive, as they often call it, variant of the plane. With all the guns and the best engines and the best Norden sight and everything on it. And this model, massive as it is, is a 172 scale from Corgi, and it is die cast. And it is solid metal. This thing weighs multiple pounds. It is almost impossible to lift with one hand, especially on the stand, which itself is metal. It is an impressive model. And it has several articulated parts, including turrets, flaps, and even a hinged bomb bay. It even has crew figures inside, which is pretty neat. This was kind of always the pinnacle of the die-cast plane world, these big bombers. They've also done the B-24. Some of the British, like the Halifax. And some of the smaller, like the B-25. And we'll get to some of those. But for today, the Flying Fortress. <sighs> like I said, I will do my best, guys. So bear with me. It's a big plane. In reality, and even in model. The B-17 is over 74 feet long and has a wingspan of just shy of 104 feet. It had a maximum bomb load between 4,500 and 8,000 pounds. Pretty much range, you know, close range, say 400 miles or less, it could deliver up to 8,000. If you wanted to send it way out there, 800 miles, you needed about 4,500 pounds of bombs on board. Had a crew of 10. Early versions had as few as 7 machine guns, but versions like the G here up that to. 13 50 caliber Browning Modus guns. It could get up to 280 miles per hour, but it liked to cruise at about 190 or less. And it had a ceiling of a little bit over 35,000 feet. So it could really get up there and outfly some of our older planes. As you see, it has four engines. And was built tough. In fact, that's what the B-17 is really known for, was how much punishment, how much of a beating it could take. And still return home safely. And it could even return home with an engine knocked out. Maybe even two if you were lucky. It was the third most produced bomber of the war 
and it dropped the most ordnance of any bomber over the war, at least the most tonnage. And they would build over 12,700. It would be produced at Boeing, Douglas, and Lockheed's Vega factory, Vega plant. And it's kind of interesting that Douglas would build the B-17. Well, this all dates back to 1934, when the U.S. Army Air Corps issued a request for a new heavy bomber to replace the aging Martin B-10. The new bomber needed to be able to hit at least 200 miles per hour, although 250 would be preferable. It needed to have a reasonably high ceiling. And it needed to be able to carry a relatively large bomb load, certainly more than the previous model. It also needed to be able to operate in far away American territories like Alaska and Hawaii. And needed to be multi-engine. So in 1935, Boeing worked on what was known as the Model 299, basically what we would call the XB-17. It first flew in July of that year and was delivered to Wright Field in Ohio in August. And it was there. It was going to have a multi-week fly-off with entries from Douglas and Martin. But really early on, it was the clear star of the show. The Air Force, or I should say, sorry, Air Corps, at the time, generals, really just wanted to just suspend the test and just go with the, the Boeing. But, uh, you know. In government, you have to go by your rules. And the Army was in favor of continuing tests. Well, the first couple of flights went well, but in October, due to human error from the crew, the prototype crashed, killing two people. They didn't exactly blame the plane because it was an error, but at the same time, since there wasn't a prototype to continue the testing, the fly-off, it was disqualified. Instead, the Douglas... B-18 Bolo was adopted, making the Army happy because the Bolo was significantly cheaper, about two-thirds the cost of the Boeing. This is because it, along with the Martin entry, were only two-engine. So cheaper, but the Boeing entry was much faster, had a, more of a bomb load, it was more durable and well-armed. That's actually where its name, Flying Fortress, arises from. It was named that by a reporter, and Boeing liked it, so they trademarked it. And that was the early ones. The early planes, the early prototypes, only had five 30 cal machine guns, but quickly that was upped over time. Well, you know, since the B-18 isn't especially famous... And the B-17 is that this ultimately won out because it was just a superior design and it was a more modern aircraft. Very forward thinking for the 1930s. So a little bit of um, kind of legalese. The Air Corps was able to get a few more ordering 13 in January of 1936 as test and evaluation planes, eventually getting the uh, designation YB-17. And, th and so throughout 1937, they would evaluate the planes, and these would have slightly better engines, better design than the original prototype. And really, by this point, the um, 
the whole thing was kind of dying down. It was less uh, of a political hot potato. And with war looming more and more on the horizon, Army's objections to the Air Corps wanting this plane were low enough. By April of 1938, they were able to officially adopt it as the B-17. And actually in 1940, they would place an order for over 500 of the planes. Again, you don't really hear much about the Douglas Bolo, so yeah, it didn't really go much of anywhere, even though it officially won the trials. These were just going into service when Pearl Harbor happened. In fact, fewer than 200 were in American military service. The British would actually acquire these early on. That's, they would call it the Fortress 1. They would get the B-17C model, which had new flaps and new rudders and a few other little design tweaks. And they would try employing them, and they wouldn't do great. The early versions really, in 1941, when the British tried using them, they were not um, terribly successful. So the British would kind of retire these very quickly from being bombers, to coastal patrol craft, anti-submarine patrol craft. And what America did, being smart, they kind of let the British prototype them, and they took notes. And then they would go to the D and eventually E variants, increasing the guns and increasing the, uh, the engines, and uh, just overall making the plane more survivable. And it was by the... B-17F variant that things were really coming together. The F was really the version that went to war with America in 1942-43. Now these were in the Pacific, but not in large numbers. In fact, uh, three dozen were in the Philippines when the Japanese invaded. Most were destroyed on the ground. A few were kind of saved briefly, but they didn't really do much there. Their, their remaining ones were evacuated. And actually a dozen were in the air on December 7th during Pearl Harbor. Uh, most of those survived. I think two maybe were destroyed during the attack. And those would go on to fight in the war. And in 42-43, about 150 to 180 were in the Pacific. And they were used to attack Japanese convoys. Not all that successful, but they did sink a couple of destroyers, several troop transports, and they also acted as a deterrent, causing more than a few Japanese convoys to turn back. But all in all, since this was a high-altitude bomber, it wasn't really well suited for the Pacific. Therefore, in January of 43, the B-17 was ordered out, and the new B-24 was ordered in, and later the B-29, also from Boeing. So, this really had its day in Europe. It would first be used in the Middle East, North Africa, and then it would be, you know, the first American units with these would be transferred to England through May and July of 1942, and they would have their first bombing raid in August of that year. And in Europe, that, that raid was quite successful, and of course we're using the newer versions at this point, updated from the sea. Throughout 43, as most know, the, uh, the British would do nighttime bombing, kind of aerial bombing, and the Americans would do daytime strategic bombing, trying to target German manufacturing and all that good stuff. <laughs> and then they started going deeper and deeper into Germany, and this is when problems happened. They would fly these in a box formation, kind of a staggered box, to maximize machine gun coverage, but German fighters quickly got clever. They called this the uh, the porcupine, but uh, they got clever of how to kind of strafe the boxes and, and fire against them and such. And also, the box formations didn't do a damn to protect the planes against flak. And the problem was, at this point, there wasn't a long-ranged fighter escort. They could escort these 
near England, but once they got deep into Germany, they were on their own. Originally, they thought, oh, all these machine guns. Of course, they, like I said, they kept upping the machine guns. Eventually, landing on 13 would do the trick, but um, nope. In fact, they even tried doing a dedicated machine gun version of the B-17, the B-40. It's kind of a bomber escort bomber, and it was a astounding failure. So, uh, but so what happened? Uh, the the deep penetration bombing missions were suspended after heavy losses, as much as twenty five percent. And so, it wasn't until April of nineteen forty four that they resumed, when P forty sevens fitted with new drop tanks and, the, of course, the new Star of the War, the the Mustang, the P fifty one, also fitted with drop tanks had the range to escort bombers like this as well as the B-24 and so deep penetration runs started happening into Germany again and these really intensified starting in April May of 44 in preparation for the D-Day uh, recapture of France because they wanted to basically a destroy as much German production as possible especially aircraft and B draw out a lot of German fighters to come up against these planes and then wallop them with the new P-51s. And so this really took a toll on the Luftwaffe. And of course they kept bombing Germany. And like I said at the beginning, this delivered the most ordnance of any American bomber in the war. And despite heavy losses, especially early on, the daylight strategic bombing continued and now of course the new fighters still did nothing to help with uh, with flak that's just uh, one of those things but they still had air superiority going deep into 44 by September October and the last major heavy bombing raid into Germany was on April 25th of 1945 and certainly these planes were a great deal of why Germany's manufacturing capacity was greatly diminished towards the last couple of years of the war. Now there's a bunch to be said on the B-17. Uh, and I can't even do it all today, not even a tenth. But um, just a very historical plane. You know, looking in the back we have the very famous uh, tail gunner. On the bottom we have the uh, lonely uh, ball turret gunner on the bottom there. We have two side guns. We have a top gun above those, kind of above the radio compartment. In front of that we have our bomb bay. In the front we have the uh, chin guns and the forward turret and then we have a turret on top of and slightly behind the cockpit this of course as I said used the Norden bomb site which was an early analog computer that was gyro stabilized for use in flight and it greatly basically allowed this thing to bomb from a much higher altitude than uh, previous bombers just using visual sides. It also did make the plane a little more vulnerable during its uh, final bom bombing run approach because the bomber would take control of the plane flying it as straight and level as possible making it the easiest possible target for fighters and flat guns so it was a trade-off but in all in all it got the job done. Production would end and May to June of 1945 and uh, mostly these would quickly go out of American service because of the new B-29. It's worth saying that Brazil would keep some B-17s through 1968 just according to Wikipedia <laughs> and these would also be kept on as search and rescue planes for a time in the Pacific and some were converted for other duties because, I mean, they had thousands of them after the war. Many went to the boneyard. Many were given away to American allies. And again, many were repurposed. 
Just a cool historical plane and a really good model from Corgi. This is an older Corgi model. This one was made a few years back and it's kind of old stock. Again, it's solid metal. We have articulating bomb bay doors. We have uh, movable flaps on the wings. We have retractable, extendable landing gear housed in the engine wells. And they even have rubber tires that really spin. Most all of your turrets and things will spin. Might be hard for me to do, but the ball turret is actually fully, uh, fully articulated. Can rotate down and sideways. Pretty cool. And again, it has an interior with pilots and seats and controls. This was always an expensive model. Years ago, it was a hundred bucks. Today, you don't really find them. Although, I believe that Corgi is coming out with a new B17G later this year. Again, this is uh, an older one. Of course, the props spin. Comes with this nice metal stand. And it is uh, articulated itself, so you can kind of move the plane. You can bank it. It's also nice for putting on a shelf. You, if you have uh, several bombers, you can kind of bank them all to one side to save a little shelf space. Because this thing is about 18 inches or more, maybe 20 inches with the wingspan. So it will take up the shelf space. And again, it's heavy, so don't put it on a light shelf. And uh, lengthwise, oh, I guess it's 14, 15 inches long. And you've got those little guns in the back, so you don't want to cram it up right up against a wall. But I um, figured a lot of you are World War II aficionados and you would enjoy a look at the Flying Fortress. And if you did, I appreciate it. And if you could, like, share, and subscribe. And also check out some of my other videos. And I will get to some of the other bombers. Not all of them, because I don't have them. Some of them I don't even make. But we'll, we'll cover a few more. <laughs> well, this is Misha. Appreciate you tuning in, and I'll catch you very soon. Next time.